uh, our next speaker is uh, Alan Grooms, uh, process and research engineer at Madison Metropolitan Sewage District. Uh, Alan formerly served as a project engineer as, at Town and Country Engineering, project manager at Aqua Aerobic Systems, and is trained as a surface warfare division officer for the U.S. Navy. So, please welcome. Basically, we've had a lot of stuff going on with startups for new processes. We've got a lot of construction going on right now. So, um, I unfortunately, I wasn't quite as able to prepare for this as I would have liked, but uh, I think I think it will still be interesting nonetheless. So, basically, what I'm going to talk to you today about is a little bit about uh, extracting uh, energy from wastewater, which isn't necessarily a traditional place you think about it, but in the wastewater industry, and I don't know what my sense is the spectrum here is kind of a little bit of every, everything. Um, it's really become kind of a buzz in the field. Um, basically, treating wastewater is a pretty energy intensive process as, as you think about it. Um, you know, just kind of not on here, but from the standpoint of from the time we pump water out of the ground to the time we use it, and just to pump it, treat it, get it to you, and then get it treated to standards that are suitable for discharge, it's usually for a typical municipality, it represents about a third of their energy budget. Which is pretty significant when you think about it. Of an entire city, a third of that energy is, is just to uh, to get water to and from you. So it's uh, obviously it's something we'd like to reduce the amount of energy we put into that. Uh, typical wastewater treatment is about 2,100 2, kilowatts per million gallons treated, and there's a little bit of economy of scale. Uh, larger larger facilities may be able to do it a little bit less. Smaller may do more. There's also a degree of a, an element of a standard of treatment, how, how uh, tight the optimal limits are, so to speak. Um, we're at about 2,370 kilowatts per milligram, or million gallons treated, so we're a little bit above the average. Um, we get about 40 million gallons a day of wastewater from uh, Mad City Madison. We're actually not a part of the city of Madison. We're actually, uh, Madison is our largest customer, but uh, we serve actually 43 municipalities in the area. So. The sum total of that is about 40 million gallons a day. Uh, and one thing that I would say is unusual about us that maybe makes our energy a little bit higher is we pump all flow to us and away from us. Uh, typically, if you're at all familiar with uh, wastewater conveyance and treatment, um, typically you get a free ride one way or the other. You can come, either it flows to the plant by gravity and you pump it away, or you know maybe it's pumped to the plant and gravity flows away. Um, Beyond this discussion, but just suffice to say, we have to do it both ways, and I'm hard pressed to think of another major facility that, that does that. So, that's certainly when you think about the energy to pump 40 million gallons of wastewater a day, you know, treated water a day, that's a that's a fair amount of energy we put into this. So, uh, this has got yeah, a little pointer here. I don't know if you can see that in the back. Uh, this is just the last five years of energy use per unit flow. On the, on the right hand axis is uh, how many flow uh, gallons a day we, we take um, on average. And on the left is our power consumption. So as you can see this little bit of this economy of scale represented here. We had this uptick in 2008, which was a wet year, and we actually used less energy. Uh, now keep in mind that's uh, per unit of water that we received. We act, that's not to say we use less energy as far as the bill we pay. But it really kind of allows us to equate how we're doing. As you can see, as the flow dropped, uh, it's, it's, it's increased here. And we have an anomaly here where it, uh, you know, we really dropped off. And in conjunction with that, we had an issue where we had to shut down our, uh, our, uh, en our energy recovery systems for a few months. And we had construction started. So that, uh, those two things combined to really make us uh, kind of glitch out there on that, on that graph. So, how this pertains to what we're talking about today is the, 
the idea of extracting energy from wastewater. Um, the research that's out there, they talk about being able to, the raw wastewater, and just what comes to the treatment plant, contains 10 times, some, some researchers say more, the amount of energy contained in that than what it takes to treat it. And when you think about what I just gave you for figures, what it takes to treat it, that's, that's kind of staggering. Um, so it really kind of gets you thinking, gets you excited about the prospect of uh, becoming energy neutral, uh, energy independent, or maybe even an exporter of energy, where you're not just a wastewater treatment plant, but you're actually putting power out on the grid routinely. Um, worldwide, I'm only aware of one plant that's doing that outright, and that's a plant over in Strauss, uh, Austria. Um, there's some unique things about that. There are a handful of other plants, including uh, Sheboygan here in Wisconsin, that do, uh, do this periodically, where they export energy to the grid. Uh, but the rest of the plants that do that are doing it on uh, hauled waste. Uh, they're kind of cheating, although in, in this arena, cheating is, cheating is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'll cheat if that's what it takes to get the energy neutral. Um, but when you start thinking about the raw wastewater, getting that energy out is, is where the problem is. You know, that's how do you tap that? Uh, that's where the real challenge lies. Um, and just a little bit about us. I mentioned that we are not part of the city. We are actually, uh, the city is just one of our customers. The district itself was established in 1930, and we have one treatment plant. Uh, it's on down by Southtown Boulevard, down um, just off the Beltline, the Nine Springs plant. Uh, and that's where everything is pumped to and treated and pumps away from there. When they started the plant there at Nine Springs, it was what we would call secondary treatment. You know, just basic, uh, basic taking out um, the inerts and some basic knocking down the biological demand. That was a pretty progressive idea for the period. Um, uh, and from that, we were also getting some biogas. Uh, even back in 1930, they were, they were extracting biogas from the anaerobic digestion. The waste sludges then were then dried after digestion. They were stabilized, dried, and sent to local fields. Not all that different than what we're doing today, actually. This is just an old slide to kind of give you an idea. Um, you know, these are three of the anaerobic digesters. This, looks like, this picture is actually taken in 1953. And these are our treatment basins. We're still using all these structures. In fact, these covers were put on in 1935, and we're just now replacing them as part of this project. So, these covers, these, these tanks here, are what we store our biogas in, in a floating cover. So that's our reservoir. So as we generate biogas from decomposition anaerobically, and we store that there until we can actually use it. This is uh, the pouring of one of the anaerobic digesters in 1935. So um, we're still using those digesters. This is kind of interesting, but it'll be maybe more interesting later when I get a little bit to it. This is a pair of engine generators. Uh, they're burning biogas, and they're, uh, I shouldn't say engine generators, they're blowers driven by biogas. So these are internal combustion engines, uh, and this is from the 1951, but they're overhauling this one back here. Um, and then these basically are just burning biogas and driving mechanical, driving a blower to help provide the aeration, which is one of the major consumers of power um, for wastewater treatment. This is originally what we had for a district. It was basically the city of Madison, Shorewood Hills, here right in the uh, campus area, and then Village of Middleton was part of the original district. So it was a fairly small area. Contrast that for now. I don't know how well you can see that, but we'll clear up. You can kind of see we've got quite an area here. And that starts to explain why you've got to spend so much energy pumping. These photos here, these are these old covers, uh, the floating covers I told you about. We just replaced those. So I think at 85 years, we, we got the goodie out of those. We got our money's worth there. Uh, and these are the first three anaerobic digesters. This, this one here is buried in the ground. And uh, most of our anaerobic digesters actually are buried in the ground. Part of that is for insulation. Um, and then, you know, it's, it just makes a cleaner site. So that's what's going on in these tanks. One of the problems with biogas utilization and I think, I don't, I, I didn't catch all the landfill one this morning, but I know that we certainly wrestle with it in the wastewater industry. One of the uh, prevents us from fully utilizing this is um, we have what's called siloxanes in the wastewater that comes in, and it manifests itself in the digester gas. And the siloxanes are basically just silicon compounds. They've been uh, really come into prominence in the last uh, decade or two. Uh, they're put in like shampoos and personal care products, lotions and things, and they make really nice products for home use. They're probably in more things than you realize. But those silicon compounds go in through the digester and they come out in the gas, 
and under combustion temperatures, uh, that silicone becomes silicates, uh, basically sand. And you don't have to know too much about um, combustion engines to know that sand in your engine is not a good thing. Not if, not if you want to be maintenance free and trouble free. So what we have here is that basically we had to add this in uh, to clean the gas, to take the siloxanes out. And we're using internal combustion engines, which are actually surprisingly tolerant of that sort of thing. So when you start looking at the more efficient technology, you know, we talk in bigger terms, but when you start getting down to the details of design, there's a lot of parasit, what I'll call parasitic loads associated with these kind of things. You've got to pressurize the gas and things like that that really nickel and dime you, so to speak, so that, you know, at the end it maybe isn't quite as efficient as you might wish it was. So those are some of the maybe more practical aspects that come into play as we try and uh, make full use of the gas that we can generate. So as we walk through you know, our biogas uses, uh, we've got a couple of uh, engine generators. Those are the, those, uh, basically the biogas powered internal combustion engine powers the uh, 450 kW generators. We do two of those. We have one engine driven uh, gas, uh, gas engine blower that still remains. And then we have six hot water boilers and four steam boilers on site. Uh, the steam boilers are a new addition. Um, the steam, the hot water boilers um, do what, just what it sounds like. We, uh, because just taking the energy off the biogas isn't really enough. Uh, to really get full efficiency, you've got to make use of some of that heat recovery. The cogeneration is what they would call it, the power industry. Um, and that's essentially what we're doing. We're taking not just the energy from the combustion, but we're taking that waste heat and we're pulling that off and trying to make useful work out of that. Um, that's got its own set of challenges. But this is uh, one of our engine generators, and it's pretty, you know, this is the, um, hopefully it shows up good, because from my angle it doesn't, uh, isn't all that easy to see. But it's a big uh, Waukesha uh, engine. It's just fueled by biogas rather than uh, natural gas or something like that. And our generator back here. Uh, this is one of the engine blowers, and if, uh, if you're really observing, this is from the opposite side, that earlier photo I showed of the engine on the overhaul. This is the same spot. So it's a newer engine, but it's actually the same blower back here that's hooked to. And um, it's still doing useful work for us. So um, this is one of the older hot water boilers, um, one of the newer, more efficient models. So the boilers themselves are actually pretty tolerant of uh, what I'll call dirty gas. Um, I know the guy this morning on the landfills was talking about the lower BTU gas. Uh, that's typically what we're producing as well. Uh, pipeline gas is usually around 1,000 uh, BTUs per cubic foot. Um, <coughs> we're getting about 550 to 6, 550 is about what we run. Uh, if you get too far below 500, it gets real difficult to, uh, to burn it at that rate. So. Um, so we've kind of talked about direct combustion, direct use of the biogas, and I alluded to the heat. The heat is essential in order to make this cost effective. Um, we do, off these engines, you know, you've got waste heat when you run an engine. Um, we take jacket water, which is basically would be the radiator in your car. Um, we take that and recover the heat off that. We take lubricating oil, we cool that down and take the heat away from that, and the exhaust heat as well. So on the even on the exhaust pipes, we've got heat exchangers on that to pull heat out of that. And what we do, is, by doing that, it reduces the need to send biogas to a boiler, so we can send more of it to power generation. Um, you know, all that, uh, we, take, we can use that hot water, and that hot water makes a convenient loop to run around the site and transmit energy. Um, we don't always think about heat or hot water as a form of energy, but really, you know, when we talk about hotter, you know, it's a cold day out, it's really got less energy in the atmosphere. So it really, you know, heat is really, when we think temperature, it's just a measure of the heat energy, really, that's in there. So um, for us, the hot water is just a convenient way to move it around the site. Uh, so what, what do we do with this hot water? Well, the obvious thing would be to heat things with it. We heat our anaerobic digesters with it. We want those to be about 95 to 100 degrees. Um, you know, when we're treating wastewater, we're basically trying to speed up the natural processes that are going on in the environment. And um, it's not a coincidence that the anaerobic digesters want to run the same temperature as your, your body. Um, it's really just an accelerating process, really. Uh, building, heating, ventilating. Heating the building makes sense. I think everybody would guess that. Uh, but we also do a lot of air conditioning through that. Uh, we do an absorption chiller, so we use the hot water in the summertime actually to cool the building. Um, 
And then a new one for us is uh, drying recovered struvite. And that, I'll touch on that at the end. It's maybe not directly energy related, but it does have uh, implications as we look forward to the future. So um, this is that same engine blower I showed before. And this is just one of the exhaust heat exchangers we show here. Uh, it's just basic. Any of these pictures you see the uh, orange pipes, reddish orange, those are uh, part of the hot water loop. So this is uh, a two, uh, spiral heat exchanger. Uh, what This is what uh, will circulate the hot water through and then the sludge from the digester goes the opposite direction. So that's how we heat that and control the temperature. Um, and then this is, uh, this is the struvite dryer I talked about. It's basically just air comes in and we heat it through here and, and heat it through this part and then this dryer. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the tail end. We're pretty excited about those. So I'm covering a lot of ground here. So we're, you know, to kind of get a perspective where we are, this graphic is maybe tough to really make full sense of. The thickness of the lines are basically, this is what our energy we have. Uh, this is purchased fuel here. This is uh, purchased fuel in the form of diesel and, and road fuels here. Uh, it maybe gives you a flavor for what we're, what we're doing. You know, this is for electricity um, you know, coming through this wide stream. The relative thickness of the line is, is you know, how much is going through that stream. This is natural gas going through here. Uh, much of it goes to make electricity. Some goes to thermal. One of the interesting things, I know earlier there were some questions about the low cost of natural gas. And what, what we're seeing from that, um, as a ramification of that, uh, whereas before when it was higher cost a few years ago, we would run the engine generators related to how much gas we had. We will actually buy pipeline gas, it's cheap enough now, that we'll burn, buy it, we can buy that gas, we can pay the O&M on the engine generators, and still it's cheaper for us to do that than it is to buy the equivalent electricity. So right now we're in a situation where we run those generators at capacity in order to uh, do that. But as I alluded, the heat energy management sometimes dictates that we ratchet down the generators because we don't have anywhere to go with the heat. So it kind of speaks to maybe some of the underlying complexity with how to tap this and how to fully utilize. You Just having this energy isn't enough. You've got to figure out how to effectively use it, how to harness it. Um, this is the digester gas component. Much of that goes for electricity, as I mentioned. Uh, some of this goes for thermal energy. We have a little bit for mechanical energy here. That's our engine-driven blower. Um, we've got some efficiency losses, some heat loss uh, that goes through here. And then this is our road fuel you know, for uh, hauling in that. I know there were some questions earlier about CNG and use of that. We, we looked real hard at that, is whether that's a viable use for a biogas. And uh, it, it's viable from the standpoint of feasibility. You can do it. Uh, economically, for us, it doesn't make sense, uh, simply because um, the cost of conversion of the vehicles and, and to pay and operate the vehicles, really you need a, a vehicles that put get a lot of use to get some road miles on it. We really just don't have that large a fleet, nor do we put that many miles on vehicles. So it really, for us, we looked at this, and it really still makes the most sense for us to put them to our generators and our boilers. Um, so it's kind of... Continuing on with where we're at now, um, you know, our annual energy budget is about two and a half to three million dollars that we spend on electricity. Um, all of the stuff I talked about with biogas utilization and generation and offsetting on thermal costs uh, with the heat water, hot water recovery, for all of those efforts, and we've been doing a lot of these since the 30s, uh, we're only offsetting about a third of our power that we use. So to give you kind of a perspective on that. Uh, so we've got about two-thirds of the way to go to get to an energy-neutral proposition. Uh, and we're looking down the road at uh, the tighter re regulations for discharge and treatment, <coughs> we're expecting that that energy intensity is going to go up. We're going to have to use more energy to do some of these things as we look at things like um, uh, chlorides in the wastewater. You know, there's really only one way to take that out, and that's um, uh, reverse osmosis. Um, otherwise, we, you know, we're, we're trying to think about doing things like on the public front, to get reduced usage there, you know, take it out before it gets in the stream. But realistically, it's just probably not going to happen to the degree we would need it to. So uh, this kind of just kind of gives a graphical comparison of where we're at compared to average. Uh, I wrestled with whether this should be earlier or not. This, uh, you know, as you can compare here, this on this left side is um, typical, and on the right side then is basically what we're doing. Most of the stuff is pretty. 
much the same. Activated sludge were right in line. Same with uh, down here with primary treatment and others. We're a little bit below average in solids handling and lighting buildings due to some of the efficiencies and things we're doing. As I mentioned earlier, the pumping were considerably higher. That's really where we're getting hit on. Um, just one more uh, graph here. This is just uh, kind of showing our, uh, this is kind of relates to what we had earlier with the, uh, the, the average. And you can see we've kind of gone up uh, the last few years. Basically, everything we're doing right now, we're saving about 675,000 years. So doing the math, you know, we're, we're, you know, that's about where we're at. Um, that we're odd that we would be paying more if we weren't doing these measures. So, so as we touch base on what we've already done to reduce our energy use, you know, we've done things like years ago we put in uh, fine bubble diffusion. Um, it takes a little more pressure to put into it, but overall it's an energy savings because uh, it's a more efficient transfer. You get more surface area under bubbles. Um, we track our energy use uh, through our computer programs to kind of alert operators when they need to change how they're operating the plant um, or to maybe shave peaks off. There are things we can do. Sometimes we have, uh, if we're close, that we can step it back a little bit and avoid uh, setting a new demand charge. We've got high efficiency motors, and those have pretty much become standard in the industry. Uh, we're pretty much there already. Um, we're using the digester gas to generate electricity. I already touched on that, and the lighting. And we just did a recent project to replace uh, some mixers in the selector zones. We've looked at that and tried to reuse that. So, and that's a surprising amount of energy as well. Things that we're going to have to do further to try to reduce. Um, you know, if we're going to really go for energy neutrality, where there's really a three-pronged approach. You know, you're really going to want to try and reduce your demand as much as you can, increase your generation, and then if the gap that you've got there, that energy deficit, that's the point I think we'll start looking at things like photovoltaics and solar. Um, we really need a, a breakthrough in how we treat wastewater. You know, pumping air into uh, wastewater, it's very difficult to, um, to make any major advances. We're doing a lot of the, the things we can do right now. But what we, you know, immediate term projects, we're looking at maybe a little bit more efficient blowers, uh, maybe a little bit more flexibility, uh, changing the diffuser density, and then we're looking at maybe making some changes. Our engines are getting a little bit older, so we may be able to gain some by just going to more efficient units. Um, that, though, I mean, there are some unintended consequences that come with some of that. Um, there was a utility that did a recent change where they were using the waste heat and they put in more efficient units, and uh, what they found was they didn't save as much as they thought because that reduced uh, the waste heat. Uh, a higher efficiency means less waste heat. I mean, that energy went somewhere. You put it to motive cores, you didn't have it in the waste heat portion, so they actually had to offset some of those savings with additional fuel to make up for that lost heat. So you have to be aware of the unintended consequences and kind of work things through holistically. Um, the other things we're looking at to increase our energy production, um, you know, obviously we'd like to bring, to generate more energy from our existing digesters. Uh, one of those is establishing what the full capacity of those are. We, we at Nine Springs wrestle with a seasonal problem with uh, foaming. So from my perspective, it's really hard to go out and try and solicit more high strength waste to make more energy when we have a hard time in the wintertime controlling what we have. Uh, part of these new upgrades where I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're hoping will have a positive effect on that. Uh, if it does, and we have that capacity, we'd like to probably go out and try and bring in some higher strength waste, and those might be fats, oils, and greases. Although the high-grade fats, oils, and grease are already being, uh, that, that market is already being tapped by um, people that recover that and either turn it into biofuels or to other consumer products. You might be surprised at where some of that waste grease goes. Um, also high-strength waste from other producers, uh, dairies, uh, methanol producers come, or uh, ethanol manufacturers come to mind. Uh, we've done a little bit over the years with dairies, um, uh, and if that opportunity came up again, we'd certainly go after so one of the things we're a little bit intrigued with right now is the idea of food, food scraps. Uh, probably not added directly to the digesters. If we looked at that, that's a lot more problematic. It almost would have to be more of a source separated organics problem um, challenge there. And that's, uh, we're kind of looking at that right now. And I know the city of Madison's also looking at that at this time. So 
This was one I kind of hinted at earlier. This is that screw, that screw bike driver I was talking about earlier. What we're doing here, I mean, we've been talking a lot about energy, but there's a lot more to recover from wastewater than just energy. And one of the things, another thing that's really gaining a lot of traction and buzz in the field right now is uh, nutrients. And obviously, we'd like to reduce phosphorus going out to our environment. Um, what this does, um, you know, when we have anaerobic digestion, you form a lot of, um, you know, if there's phosphorus in, in the waste that goes in, the activated sludge, it'll break down and release that phosphorus, orthophosphorus is in the, uh, in the, in the breakdown product, the liquid product. And we also get a lot of ammonia from the breakdown of the organic compounds, the proteins, that sort of thing. Um, we get a compound called struvite when you have enough uh, phosphorus and ammonia and magnesium. And the water composition of the upper Midwest, particularly the Madison area, uh, we're blessed or cursed, take your pick, with a lot of magnesium in the water. So that manifests itself as a problem in our plant in the form of struvite, which is a solid compound. It forms, nuisance forms in, in pumps, uh, mixers, pipes, and I mean, it will completely plug them off. And what we've teamed with here is a company called Ostara. Uh, they're actually harvesting struvite, controlled precipitation, and actually taking this out as a fertilizer product, a slow release of fertilizer. So what this is, is an upflow fluidized bed reactor. And so we're basically making these product, this, this, these small prills. And this is the um, seventh plant in uh, uh, North America that we just put online about two weeks ago. So we just did the first harvest a couple days ago. So we're starting to get product off of that. Directly, the phosphorus maybe doesn't pertain specifically to the energy, but indirectly, I mentioned the ammonia. The ammonia demands about four and a half times the amount of oxygen that regular waste demands in treatment. And that ammonia's got to go back and be treated when we take it off the digester. So we're going to reduce about 20% of our ammonia coming back by this process. So. You take that and multiply that. That's equivalent of about 80% uh, of our incoming, of the waste we'd be treating. The, the, that load reduction would be the equivalent of about um, four pounds for every pound of ammonia we take out, as far as oxygen. And I mentioned the oxygen is a high demand thing. So indirectly, all these things interrelate directly and indirectly. And it's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a real challenge with trying to do this. It's to follow through how the positive and negative impacts of every move you make, everything you do, you know, maybe, maybe you've done something to increase the efficiency of your engines, but maybe you were relying on that heat, so you gotta find, you know, what's that impact and follow that through to its logical conclusion. So it makes it interesting, challenging, however you wanna call it, so. Um, I showed an earlier photo just overhead of our plant. This is where we're at today. <coughs> This, this is the area here that was in that original picture. So obviously we've grown quite a bit over the years uh, and we're growing right now. So um, hopefully uh, continue to provide good treatment for everybody. I know that was kind of a uh, scattershot journey through things. It's kind of hard to make a kind of cohesive approach to that because the stuff is pretty interrelated. But um, I'm open for any questions if, um, if anybody has any. I'm sure there's probably a few. So I might have missed, but the, do, you, do you somehow make a clean water from waste, like dirty water, so that we could drink? Or? Uh, the question was whether we make clean water from the wastewater. Um, we, we do, um, I guess, yeah, it's, I was kind of focused on the energy aspects, but yes, we're doing basic uh, treatment to, um, uh, it's, it's good quality, it's better quality than what's in the background, uh, but it's not drinking water quality. The tech, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, we're not, we're, um, you know, we're well under what our DNR permit requires. We're not necessarily making drinking water quality or, uh, there is limited reuse projects we're working on. Uh, there's a few golf courses that do some reuse of our effluent for irrigation. Um, you know, the, the standards for making drinking water quality right now, it, it would be probably pretty tough, uh, fairly, and very energy intensive. So we're not doing that at this time. That's not to say that there won't be a future where that's going to be looked at. Um, as we get more and more water shortages, particularly in certain areas of the country or the world, uh, that's going to be looked at and embraced, I, I believe. How do you determine if it's, like I saw on your map, the district that you had, and mm -hmm. some, you know, it was just like isolated. Trade off of treating that on site. 
kind of sum up the question was on some of these remote areas that we handle for the district, how do we determine the economics of whether it's vi you know, economically viable to, to bring it in and treat it. Really, the, each of those municipalities has a consulting engineer that, um, you know, that handles their engineering, and they really do those assessments, and they look at that on an individual basis. We look at what it's going to cost to treat, and you know, we've got a number of pumping, the major pumping stations and interceptors we operate. But how it works is much like um, much like your city or town you live in is going to send you a water bill. We send our communities a bill, just much like that. We send out 43 bills, so we just have 43 customers. So in some respects, it's simpler. But we just break down what it costs them, and then they look onto that. Um, their engineer would look at that and then do the math on what it would cost to do their local system. And if it looked like it was economically viable, then then they would approach us for annexation to come in. Um, and that, you know, then we'd have to consider that application, you know, what the impact would be on infrastructure and that sort of thing. So, um, it isn't really directly determined by us, but we do play a role in determining that. So, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. What is done with the screw by after you precipitate out of the drive? The question was what is done with the screw by after we precipitate it out and dry it? Um, basically, we have a uh, takeoff agreement with the company Ostara that we're teamed with on this. And so they're agreeing to buy the product for 10 years at uh, a certain rate per ton, product produced. Um, and we've got an agreement on how we're sharing costs as far as the chemicals. There are some chemicals involved with precipitation. But um, we're selling it to them, and, and they. It's kind of unusual for us, we're still working through it, but it's, they kind of view themselves as a fertilizer company first and foremost. So, you know, phosphorus, we're getting into maybe another topic, it's an interesting topic, but, you know, the, there's a concern about phosphorus worldwide, whether we're running out, and, you know, in my view, we're never going to run out, but the economics will shift dramatically, because what we're running out of is economically viable deposits. And as we put it in our wastewater and we send it out, it's basically we're thinly distributing it over wide area, which makes it very uneconomical. That said, we need it for life. So we're going to find a way to get it, whatever it costs. Um, these guys right now are looking at us as a phosphorus mine, basically, is how they look at it. So there's a lot of attention being paid right now, though, to recovering other items from, and I know the focus of this is on energy, but recovering other items from wastewater. Uh, there's people looking at uh, Ammonia and nitrogen as fertilizers. There's people looking at uh, metals, recovering metals. You know, it doesn't seem like you get a lot of silver, for example, coming down the pipe. But uh, it may add up to it, the, the economics on some of these metals may surprise you. So um, it, it's there's some interesting challenges in the industry. So it's a good question. Yeah. So is it better to put something down like? I don't know if you know the second part of this question, but is it better to put something on the garbage disposal or throw it away? Do you think uh, carbon, carbon-wise and energy-wise? The question was: Is it better to put something down the uh, garbage disposal or, or send it to uh, the landfill? Um, that's a good. That's a, that's a uh, currently a, another good running debate right now. Um, there's people trying to make the case both ways. You know, when you talk about sending it to the landfill, you know, they're making, it's not like you're just landfilling. They're, most of the landfills are recovering energy from that, but it may not be as effective. But when you put it on the garbage disposal, it can get fairly dilute. So depending on how, um, depending on what point it's taken out of the waste stream, um, you know, if you can get that to come to the treatment plant and use that conveyance system that's already in place, your sewer system, and get it there and be able to take it out of the primary clarifiers where you send it directly to the digesters for anaerobic digestion, that's pretty energy effective. If it's ground too finely or makes it past those primaries and gets to the aerobic treatment portion, now you're going the other way. Now you're putting energy into it to satisfy the demand. So it's a real touchy question about you know how effectively can you take it out at the proper point. And that's a combination effort you know, the technology of the wastewater plant, the people that are making the food waste disposals, that sort of thing. So it's, it's another very interesting question. It's, it's hotly debated right now, and you may not find total agreement on that. So I don't know what the answer to that is. I think uh, I'm still watching the, uh, the research being done on that. So yeah, do you have another question? Um, do you worry uh, 
during Super Bowl halftime? Do I worry during the Super Bowl yeah. halftime? No, I don't. Uh, uh, there's a there's a thing that everyone goes to the bathroom at the same time. At the same time. Yeah. No, I. I <laughs> 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 it's like, yeah, I don't really worry about it. I, that. That's not something I'm lose sleep over. But, uh, yeah. What you're getting at is, you know, the the, the the changes in the flow. For smaller communities, it can be a lot more significant. Um, for the size of community we have for Madison, um, by the time it gets to us, it gets coming through uh, the conveyance system and the uh, the pumping stations. It usually gets spread out a little bit, where it's not as recognizable. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all were here this summer, but we had a um, pretty high flow event at the end of June. Um, we had a record-setting rain, and um, you know that took about four hours to work through the system, even at capacity. So you, you had kind of a buffer there where it kind of equalized it out, and where that was a fairly intense event, I think it was about three to four hours where that heavy rain came, we had uh, about a 10-hour sustained high flow once it, once it hit us. So it really, those things in a larger system tend to stretch out, but a smaller treatment system can be a very big deal. I read a thing a few years ago, Clemson comes to mind, because it's this college town that's very much, it's a smaller in proportion to its, um, the amount of people that come to the football game there, and yeah, they've got some serious issues there sometimes when they have uh, the halftime just from the stadium, so. That was probably more than you wanted to know. <laughs> I'm sorry. There, was there any other questions? I don't know if I'm over or on, or looks like I might be on. Um, can you just talk about pharmaceuticals a little bit and the challenge that that kind of has recently come up that he's working with? Yeah, pharmaceuticals. Um, yeah, the question was on the pharmaceuticals and the challenges for wastewater treatment. There's a lot of things that are really kind of emerging. Pharmaceuticals are one of them. And for the most part, we don't, uh, here in Wisconsin, we don't really have any regulatory, nothing on the regulations for that yet. And I don't even know that it's necessarily looming, but it is certainly something that's on our radar. Um, the tests for those kind of things are pretty expensive. Um, so we're kind of balancing the economy of doing tests that aren't required for anything versus gathering data. So we usually do couple, three rounds of tests a year, just we're kind of gradually gathering some background data on what is really there and how it is affected by our treatment process. And depending on the, the compound that you're interested in, some of them are taken out by the activated sludge process and, and some of them really aren't touched by it. So it's really kind of um, hit or miss, depending on which one you're interested in. Um, but it, it's, an, it's an interesting topic and it's, it's one that I think we're going to be, you know, in the next decade, I think is going to become much more going to be much more focused on that, I think. So, uh, Right now, there isn't, uh, we don't really, really, we're just kind of in the early stages of monitoring it, specifically at Nine Springs. I know that uh, Water Environment Federation, uh, uh, the research arm of that, Water Environment Research Federation, they're both doing some looking at that, but um, I don't know if there's anything conclusive yet. The best answer is just try not to put it in there, but the problem, I think, is it's like, it isn't so much even just the med, the med drop programs have gotten fairly developed and a lot of, most people I think get that you don't want to put it down the, you know, dump your used medications on the toilet, which 10 years ago that was, that was the guidance you got. In some areas it still is. But there's so much inefficiency in how your body metabolizes medication that there's so much excreted out. I suspect you already know that, where you're kind of nodding. Um, yeah, it may be that this is more to address this problem. You know, this is a great example of one that I think is, as we look forward to the future of this, I think we're going to be doing less, just trying to address it as wastewater, you know, myself as a wastewater professional. I think we're going to be reaching across the aisles to other professions. Uh, in this case, maybe we're going to be looking at pharmaceutical manufacturers and teaming with them to say, how can we increase the efficacy of this medication so, you know, rather than 10% is metabolized, maybe it's 50%, and they can issue a smaller dose, being more cost effective for the patient, and solve our problem too. So. I think there's a host of issues like that that we're going to be teaming with other professionals on that uh, you know, we can't cost effectively solve the problem inside the fence. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Sure.
Yeah, and I don't know whether that's specifically being looked at. I suspect it is, uh, but it, it's a it's a good idea. But because we're going to have to figure out how to get some of these taken out, and some of like I said, some of them are some of them are addressed by the activated sludge process. Uh, some of them are addressed by other treatment processes we have, and some of them, quite frankly, I don't think we have the technology to treat them yet. And as we talk about, you know, one of the earlier questions was about water reuse. If we start looking at these areas where we're talking about, you know, contemplating having to drink that water again, um, you know, the technology is there to get basic treatment. It's these trace compounds that we're not positive. Do they, you know, I don't know that anyone wants to take medicine that was just in the background water, not knowingly. Um, so I think those are going to, you know, become the issues of the future. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry.